to see you next. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليما كثيرا أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم. As it relates to the issue of dealing with trials and tribulations, trials and tribulations being fitting and malahi, as the scholars of Islam named it in the individual books that the ulama of Islam used to author, showing the importance of the issue. Scholars of Islam used to write individual books about the fitting and the mulahi. And from them, the great scholar everybody knows about, Imam ibn Kathir, and other than him before his time. And if we look at the books of al-Hadith, the books of al-Imam al-Bukhari Muslim and the rest of them, in most of those books of al-Hadith, there is a chapter. That is the chapter of al-Fitin, trials and tribulations. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, sitting with his companions, and while facing them, he said that he can see the trials and the tribulations hitting or coming down upon them the same way he could see the raindrops falling upon the roofs of their homes. They all looked back, thought that he actually meant they would be able to see the fitting, but that's not what he was meaning. He was explaining to them that just as the rain hits every place, trials and tribulations are going to hit everybody. There's not a single person here, except that he has to deal with a fitting, a fitting or a number of fitting. Fitting of not being married, fitting of being married, fitting of your health, your wealth, Everybody has to deal with individual fitness. He told us, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that the man has fitna in his wife, in his money, in his neighbor, in his children. So everybody has his individual fitna, and will always have to deal with fitna as long as he is living. The Nabi told us that the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, mentioned to us that the human being has been created to be tried. Inna mu'min khuliqa. The believer has been created to be tried. He's been created and he's going to forget. He's been created and he is a person who should make toba. When he's reminded, he remembers. So no one's going to escape the trials. No one's going to escape the fitting. As a result of that, Ikhwani, the ulama of Islam, past and present, have always dealt with the issue of presenting the issue the fiqh of al-fitna. The Muslim has to come to know about the fiqh of al-Islam as it relates to dealing with fitting. Right now, as we're living in this year, there are tremendous, tumultuous fitting that are facing the ummah. Prophet mentioned many, many issues concerning the fitna, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, may Allah Ta'ala join us with him, yawm al-qiyam in the jannat al-fardos, Badiru bil amal fitting kakit al layl al muslim. Hurry up and do the good deeds while you have the opportunity and the ability to do good deeds before the fitna comes and it hits the people. And the fitna, when it hits the people, he said, 
It's going to be like a dark night. So Darkie went on to explain, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yusbihu Raju Mu'mina wa Yumsi Kafira. Wa Yumsi Mu'mina wa Yusbihu Kafira. Yabi'u Deenahu bi Aradin Minad Dunya. He said that the fitna will be to the degree where an individual will wake up in the morning, a man will wake up in the morning as a believer, as a mu'min. By the time the nighttime comes, the nighttime will greet him and he becomes a disbeliever. He goes to bed at night, the nighttime comes, he is a believer. The daytime comes, he is a non Muslim for one reason or another. So we're living in that time, the time of trials and tribulations, individually as well as as it relates to the Ummah. In the famous hadith, Hudayf ibn al Yaman said that the Nabi mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, that the other communities are going to gather together against this community the same way that diners gather collectively to eat from the same plate of food. The companions asked the question, finding that's amazing. We have our enemies, but we don't have a situation where everybody is against us. We have some enemies during that time who want to attack us, want to engage us, but all of the people, they thought that was strange. They said, Ya Rasulullah will be because we are a few people in numbers. He said, no, you people be a lot of people, but you'll be like the foam of the ocean, and Allah will take out of the hearts of your enemy the fear of you, and he will place in your hearts Al-Wahim. They said, what is Al-Wahim, Ya Rasulullah, that Allah will place in our hearts? He said, it's the fact that you love the dunya and you hate death. The meaning of this hadith, Ikhwani, is not an encouragement for a Muslim to want to die. There's a hadith that says, لا يتمنن أهدكم الموت لفتنة أصيبته No one should wish for death because of a fitna that has hit him. Whatever that fitna is, don't hope for death. Because as long as a person has the opportunity for another day, he has enough opportunity to make tawbah, to make istighfar, to do the good deeds, and that's better than being dead where your deeds run out. So that hadith, that hadith, not an encouragement for people to wish for death. Allah will take out of the hearts of your enemy the fear of you, and he'll place in your hearts the wahin. What is the wahin, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Hubba dunya and hating the death. Some foolish people take that hadith and say, You see, you can't love the dunya and you have to wish for death. That hadith is not saying that. The hadith is saying, don't love the dunya to the degree where you'll sell your religion for a miserable price and prepare yourself for death. Don't act like you're going to live forever. Hate death meeting you at a time when you're not prepared for it. That's the meaning of the hadith. Not that a person should want and desire death. In an extreme, adverse circumstance, Al-Islam allowed the person to desire death, but he has to make a condition in his dua. He told us, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, no one should hope for death. But if you have to do it, if you have to do it, then say, Allah, give me the death if it's better for me. So the point here, ikhwani, is that the nations have gathered together against the nation of al-Islam. The best ummah brought forth for the advancement and existence of mankind, as Allah mentioned in the Quran. And at this time, it is a fitna of what this community has to deal with on a level that is international in the world. These are the issues of al-fitn and more than that. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to ask his students consistently, كَيْفَ أَنْتُمْ إِذَا لَبِسَتْكُمْ fitnatun? How is the time going to come and how are you going to be when the fitna engulfs you, it envelops you, it's going to be all over. Fitna in his child, fitna in his wife, Fitness and everything connected to him. So concerning that issue, there are a number of advices that the Prophet gave, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A number of issues that come to us from the companions, radwanullahi alayhim, because they had to deal with the fitin. During the lifetime of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and after his death, the fitna of civil war and civil strife, and companions, many of whom lost their lives, so that's a fitna when we look at all of the accomplishments and all of the sacrifices of the companions during the lifetime of Rasulullah and then after he died people were getting killed 
after the death of Rasulullah. And if that happened with them, where companions were getting killed by people and the companions were fighting each other, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with all of them and they're all in Jannah, then what's the case right now where the Muslims destroy their country in totality or their external Muslim, their external enemy comes, destroys their country in totality and we can't do anything about it except have patience and hope for the best. So a number of things have been told to us by our Nabi and our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And from them is that the Rasul of al-Islam showed us the importance ikhwani, of having a ta'seel al-ilmi, having knowledge generally in your religion. Can we mention something more important than having knowledge in your religion to know how to deal with the fitna? A thing may be a fitna and a person doesn't even see it as being a fitna. So how is he going to deal with it? So the first issue is for an individual to know about his religion. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, who lived way after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the fitna of Ali ibn Abi Talib, people started coming and teaching and they started giving stories and weak hadith. Because of the stories in the weak hadith and a lack of knowledge from the community, people believed in those stories and they believed in those weak hadith. Weak hadith that establish issues connected to aqidah in the minds of people. Things that establish in the minds of the people different ibadat that they should be doing. So the whole religion began to change. So Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, showing the importance of a ta'seel al-ilmi, having the good basic knowledge of your religion. He said, during the time of the Prophet wasallam, these stories and these hadith, they were not given. Nor were they given during the time of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. But they started to be given during the time of Al-Fitin. So when the people didn't know about the statements of the Prophet wasallam and weighing what they was hearing, what they were hearing from the speakers, they started to have Ghulu and Ali ibn Abi Talib. They started to develop disrespect for the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They started to make mistakes that were not known in the first few years of al-Islam during the reign of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. Another issue about the importance of at-ta'seel al-ilmi, not just having general knowledge and some exposure to a hadith and, 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 and ayat, but having knowledge not being a scholar, but basic knowledge of the religion. During the times of fitna, we're going to be required to judge things and to go back to the kitab and back to the sunnah. If a person has no knowledge about the Quran and the sunnah, how is he going to be in a position to do what he doesn't have to give? So knowledge, basic knowledge, is going to help the Muslim in every aspect of his life. Dealing with fitna, navigating through his regular everyday living, getting married, getting divorced, whatever the issue happens to be, without that knowledge, it's going to be drama and there's going to be problems. The fitna becomes more. Look at the importance of ta'seel al-ilmi. Concerning the fitna, the scholars have always mentioned this principle that you guys should remember, and we mentioned it here on a number of occasions. They used to say, when the fitna starts and when it comes, the ulama and the people with knowledge, they see the fitna. When it first starts, before it hits the people, scholars, people with knowledge, they identify, recognize, acknowledge, this is a fitna. But when the fitna comes and it hits and it lands, and then everyone has to deal with it, now the people start to say, this is a fitna. This is a fitna. But the people who have been given knowledge, they see it before they come. So again, I have to mention this, I'm amazed in some ways, not amazed in others. As it relates to the Haraki people, the people who politics motivate them in the religion of Islam more than everything else. And as a result of the motivation of politics, they say things that are not knowledge based. They're based and they're coming from the foundation of emotions and then they cause a lot of problems. There are many du'at, many people who are given doubt a lot before the Syrian situation became the way it was, they used to encourage people 
to bear arms and to fight against people when they were not in a position to do that. Before the drama of Egypt, there were those people who used to encourage the community and to do those things. The Arab Spring, the people came and said, do it. There has to be bloodshed in order to make progress. And then when it happened and the fitna came, the people started making dua of qunut for the Muslims of Syria and Aleppo. And inshallah, dua of qunut can help. But perchance, perhaps, you shouldn't have never been a person who was encouraging this outcome in the first place. So the scholars of Islam, they're the ones who have the ability to acknowledge the fitna, which goes to show us again, as it relates to how to deal with trials and tribulations, whether they are on your community level, individual level, your family, your international level, knowledge, knowledge of the religion, knowledge of that kitab, and knowledge of the sunnah, knowledge of the history of al-Islam, those things that the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa and given instructions not to engage and not to be the person who causes fitna to continue to flourish. In addition to that, what we get from the Nabi is what is quite difficult, especially during this time, difficult from the angle of people's commitment to it. But when he described the time of fighting and all of these things that are going on right now are a clear sign and indication that he is the Rasul of Allah Azawajal because it was no way possible he could have prophesied all of these issues if he was just speaking from his own understanding and his own comprehension. He had to be divinely revealed to to inform us of all of these issues. And from the issues is the random killing and murdering that's going to take place Muslims between themselves and the people killing Muslims as well. He told the people there's going to come a time on the people where there will be widespread haraj. And an amazing thing about the hadith of Fitin, Rasulullah used to use words that the Arabs knew the words, but they didn't know what was the implied meaning when he was saying it. And this is quite prevalent in the hadith of Fitin, like we mentioned to you, that he said, Allah will put in your hearts al wahin Wahin normally means in the Arabic language to become sick, to be weak. They said, what is wahin, Ya Rasulullah? He gave them a different meaning. He said that wahin is loving the dunya and hating death. They wouldn't have never understood that from that word as if the Prophet didn't mention that to him. Sallallahu alayhi wa He said, during the times close to Yawm al-Qiyamah, there's going to be haraj. They said, what is haraj, Ya Rasulullah? He said, haraj is random murdering, just killing people. They said, but Ya Rasulullah, what we do is we kill 70,000 non-Muslims in one year. And the meaning here is not 70,000. Because all of the wars that the Prophet took place, to, he engaged in, all of the wars during his time, 70,000 people were not killed in all of those wars co collectively. When the companion said, we killed 70,000 in one year. That is the language of the Arabs. Like we say, a picture is worth a thousand words. A thousand words who came up with that number is just in our language and that's how it goes. So Allah would tell the Prophet Wasallam, if you seek istighfar from Allah 70 times, seven zero. Why did he say seven? Why did he say seven as opposed to 60 or 30 or 40? That is the culture of the language with the Arabs. They said we kill in one year a lot of non-Muslims when we fight them trying to spread Islam and they fight against us. So we fight them. He said, I'm not talking about you killing the non-Muslims and the non-Muslims killing you. I'm talking about you killing one another where a man will kill his uncle, his brother, or his cousin. They say, Ya Rasulullah, will we have our intellect with us during that time? He said, the intellect of most of the people during that time is going to be taken away. It's going to be lost. And they're going to remain a group of people. And he described them as the riffraff. That during that time, the majority of the people are going to be the riffraff. So part of what to do and what not to do during the time of fitna is not to be a copycat, not to be with the majority, not to be with the people who you're just with them because they're the majority of the people. Again, the importance of knowledge. Person has to be able to wait. I'm going to be with so and so or be against them based upon knowledge. Anyway, Akhwani, in that hadith of haraj or killing, 
He told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al Ibadatu fil Haraj ka Hijratin ilayya. Anyone who engages himself in Ibadah during that time, whatever fitna he's dealing with, if he increases his fasting, if he increases his salat, if she starts to wear better hijab, if they start to give more sadaqah, if the person increases whatever ibadah from the ibadat of Al Islam that he can do, Rasulullah said, during the time of fitna, then this individual will get the reward of making hijrah to me. Making hijrah to me. And making hijrah to the Prophet ﷺ from anywhere in the Arabian Peninsula and then giving up your home and your land and your people to go to Medina is from the best ibadat in Al Islam, best sacrifices in Islam. Which goes to show it's not something that's easy to do. So if a person is dealing with a fitting in his own personal life, the question is, instead of complaining, instead of feeling sorry for oneself, instead of overthinking and becoming overwhelmed with that fitna, what has the person done in terms of increasing their general ibadat? Al-ibadatu fil harj ka hijratin ilayya. Anyone who makes the ibadah in the fitna, and he didn't mention community fitna, international fitna, individual fitna, whatever the person is dealing with, whatever he's dealing with, increase his ibadah, whatever it happens to be. And then there are some ibadah that are obviously clearly going to help, like the individual who's not married, that is a fitna. So by him increasing in his fast, it's going to be beneficial for him. So whatever the case is, from how to deal with the fitna is what the Prophet mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, to sleep in kathira, and increasing the ibadah. We find now in giving da'wah ila Allah and listening to talks, we can come out with a lot of ayat and a lot of hadith that talk about the fitna, what to do during the time of fitna, what is the meaning of fitna, what are the ayats that mention in fitna, and how fitna means different things in the Quran. But simple, practical, simplistic things like, okay, during the time of fitna and everybody has fitna, be a better Muslim. Just increase whatever ibadah you have the ability to increase it. And don't look at any ibadah as being irrelevant or small. Like the fitna or the ibadah of leaving one's beard, not being musbil, doesn't always have to be something where he has to get up and start making salat at nighttime. Although if he does it, alhamdulillah, increasing in your husnul khuluq. Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nothing, nothing is heavier in the scales than having good akhlaq. And the one who has good akhlaq, he will reach the daraja or the level of the one who prays a lot and the one who fasts a lot. From the danger of al fitin is the jihad that needs to be made not to fall into becoming an individual who can't recognize or acknowledge the fitna because the nature of the fitna is it comes in the way and other than its reality many times like the fitna of a dajjal. So in dealing with the fitna, one of the best ways is making a ta'awwidh min al-fitn. Practical, every day. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you make salat, seek refuge in Allah from four things. And one of those four things is seeking refuge in Allah from the fitna of life and the fitna of death. So the fitna doesn't just stop after a person checks out of the dunya. You have the fitna of the qabr with the squeezing and the adab of the cover. So on an everyday basis, practically speaking, he told us to make a ta'awwidh, seek refuge in Allah. In the number of hadith, where he used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect him from the fitna. So there's a distinction and difference between a ta'awwidh, where you seek refuge in Allah from a shaitan. You seek refuge in Allah from a shaitan or from something that will harm you. He used to do that. Do that in your salat. Along with that, he used to make dua. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you. Oh Allah, protect me from, protect me from the fitna of being lazy, the fitna of being infirm, the fitna of being incapable, the fitna of the debt, the fitna of being under the power and subjugation of men, and save me from the fitna of the, and save me from the trials and the tribulations that come with the fitna. So he used to make du'a and he used to make a ta'awwidh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
as it relates to an intikasa, an intikasa, the nature of the fitna, ikhwani, is that he mentions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tu'ridu al-fitn ala al-qulub kal-hasir udan uda. The fitna and the trials and tribulations will come to the people and expose themselves to the hearts of the people and it will be extremely close to them. He said, until the point where a person, he won't be able to distinguish and recognize what is ma'roof and he won't be able to distinguish and recognize what is munkar the two things become blurred in his understanding and his vision so the hap turns out to be falsehood to him and the batil turns out to be the hap to him what is the sunnah he takes it as being something that is an innovation and what is an innovation he takes that as being the issue of the sunnah so he, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, in educating the community and informing the community, he informed us that as it relates to the issue of al-fitn, the nature of the fitna is that trials and tribulations come to a person and the person has the ability to flip and to turn, to see one thing in a way that it is not its reality. So as he deals with his fitna, whatever it is, he has the fitna of being divorced. And he finds it extremely difficult living in that situation. And he believes it's in his best interest to get remarried, to redo that relationship. He believes that's the best thing for him. But that's just the fitna. The reality of the situation is you should stay in your you should stay the way you are right now. That's the nature of a fitna. The kid has a problem in the fitna with his parents. He thinks it's this way. He swears that he's right and it's this way. But the thing that he's trying to go after may not be in his best interest. So whatever the person's fitna is, he always has to be aware and he has to ask himself the question. Is the reality of this situation the way I'm seeing it? The way I'm feeling it? The way I'm understanding it? Because it's quite possible and it's natural because it's the nature of al-fitn and the biggest fitna being the fitna of a dajjal. The dajjal comes... And he makes everything appear in a way that is not true. It's not its reality. And as the time gets worse and worse and worse, that becomes more easier because the people get further and further and further away from the fountain of an and the era that the Prophet lived in, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. So they have the ability to make the person believe that he had dajjal is Allah, the ability that he dajjal can give life and can give death, that he, Dajjal, has the ability to give the risk. And as a result of that, like the hadith said, one of them will sell his deen for a miserable price for some money that is going to be given to him by Dajjal or other than Dajjal, the fitin. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned many things. And from them, especially as it relates Ikhwani, to the communal fitin, the big ones. He mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that during the time of the fitna, don't be by yourself. But instead of being by yourself, be with the jama'ah of the Muslims. Because the shaitan is closer to one person than he is to two, and he's closer to three people than he is. A shaitan is closer to one person than he is to two. Closer to two than he is to three. Closer to three than he is to four. So when you have those fitin, the person has to seek Refuge in Allah, make dua to Allah, evaluate his situation and look for the people who can give him advice, the people who can strengthen him and help him on his situation. So when he described, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, the time that we're living in, he said you have to stick with the imam and the jama'at of the Muslims. The companions say, ya Rasulullah, what if there is no imam and then in that case, there is no jama'ah, no imam. He said, then leave alone all of these different groups that are varying amongst themselves and they're vying for position. He said, leave all of them, leave all of them. And then if you have to stay in that situation by yourself, eating from the leaves of the tree, then this is something that you should do. But generally speaking, Ikhwani, the Muslim is going to try to stick with people and stick with the group and not be by himself where he's going to overthink or he's going to be overwhelmed and overcome by the trial or by the tribulation that he's dealing with. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam 
also mention not to be from the people who are taking the initiative to start the fitna or to keep it going. We have problems between our families that has reached a degree and a level that is not acceptable. And people are oppressing one another. He said, be the son of Adam who has been killed. And don't be the son of Adam that does the killing. So from the family members are those people who are taking the initiative. So he said, what? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one who was sitting in the fitna is better than the one who was standing. He's just standing up. Because the one who was sitting, he has been rendered less capable of doing damage and harm. He can do damage and harm sitting down, but it's going to be less than the one who is standing up. And the one who is standing up is better than the one who is walking, and the one who is walking is better than the one who is running. So between our families, there are those people in the fitna or in the middle of it. They're running back and forth with tales, with lies, with oppression, things that they're doing. Prophet Muhammad said, don't be like that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, be the son of Adam that was killed. Let them lie on you. And it's going to be difficult dealing with that. And the fitna that comes with that. But it's better than you being the one who's lying. And you're being the one who's being aggressive. And you're being the one who's creating all the drama. He told his companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during the time of fitna, take your sword and break your sword off at the mountain of Uhud. Meaning what? Disengage. If you can't be a key that brings the good, then don't be the one who opens the door, pulls the door open and opens up the window for the fitna to become bet, the, the fitna to become greater, more intense. That hadith is crucial, khwani, and it's important. Another practical advice from the sunnah, Prophet Muhammad told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during the time of the fitna and dealing with fitna, he said, turn to your own affairs. Turn to and engage yourself with your own affairs and turn away from the affairs of the people. Who's doing what and why he did it and trying to figure it out. Turn to your own affair because everybody has more than enough of his own personal issues, his own private issues, his own fitting to not be engaged in other stuff. There are fitna that are going on, fitting that are going on. A person's mother and his father are not even Muslims and he's involved in this fitting on the internet, that fitting on the internet, this discussion and that discussion and he's being very critical and he has a lot to say. And in his own house, his relationship with his wife, how people are in his own house and he's being judgmental and talking about the sheikh said that and the other sheikh said that and he did this and that one over there he did this and that's from Nifaq and that's from Kufr and this is this and this and that. And his own issue is in need, dire need of his own attention. And as I mentioned, Ikhwani, there's not a single person sitting here, not one, not a single one that you can see here except that the fitna has hit him. Some more severe than others, no doubt. But the point here is, where does he get the time to worry about other fitting? Where his mind, his energy, his resources have been put in a place where they would be better used if he was taking care of his own situation and his own issue. So this is what we wanted to present to you, Ikhwani, in the way of the dhikr, as Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَذَكِّرْ فَنَّ الذِّكْرْ تَنْفَعَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And there are many issues that can be mentioned because the Prophet talked about the fitting sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam in so many shape, forms of fashion when they came to visit him. And it was Abu Bakr, told Abu Bakr, told the man, open the door, tell Abu Bakr he's from the Jannah, people of the Jannah. Umar came, tell Umar he's going to also be in the Jannah. When Uthman came, Rasulullah told the man at the door, go tell Uthman he's going to enter into the Jannah after a fitna that's going to hit him. He's going to be afflicted with a fitna, the first Muslim leader, where the people made khuruj against him. We're not going to say the first Muslim ruler that was assassinated because Umar was assassinated before him and that was a fitna. But that's a fitna where the non-Muslim took the life of Umar. So the non-Muslim is like the son of Adam who murdered his brother. And as the Quran said, 
You're going to take my sins. I'm going to take your good deeds. You're going to take my sins. That's different fitna. He said for Uthman, tell him he's going to go into the Jannah after fitna that's going to hit him. What's the fitna? The first khuruj on the Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ described that as a fitna in a number of hadith. So the Muslim has to make sure that he's on the right side of the law, the Islamic law, the Quran and the Sunnah, as it relates to these political issues that are going on. Hey, listen to what I'm telling you. With all of the strife that's going on, the Muslim is looking at it and he sees it in the wrong way. He'll say that the scholars of Al Islam, the ulama of Al Islam, they are scholars for dollars because Aleppo was happening. That's how he sees it, that's how he understands it. Where does that come from? How does he get that? That's the nature of fitna, coupled with the fact the person doesn't have any knowledge. He doesn't have any knowledge. Okay. We want to get rid of this fitna. We want to go about it, do it the right way. We're going to do something that has not been sanctioned in the religion. But we see that thing as being the right way. So we take positions for and against uh, different issues. That's just an example. Personal fitna, large scale fitna. It is important that we get knowledge of our religion. We're going to open up the floor, inshallah, ta'ala, ikhwani, five, ten minutes for any questions that you may have. From this time until 20 after, we'll take any questions you may have. Tafaddul. Hey, tafaddul, ya doctor. We're in the time of fitna. From every angle and from every direction, we're in the time of fitna. And as I mentioned, there's no one sitting in this audience except right now he's dealing with a fitna and Allah knows best. It's the nature of the hayat of the dunya. So the person shouldn't sit and say, what, does Allah want fitna for us? Allah wants bad for us, so he gives us this fitna. One of the benefits of fitna and this part of the fiqh of the fitna is the fitna makes a tamayyuz or a tamyiz. The fitna has the ability to distinguish between the true believers and those people are not true believers. The fitna has the ability, depending upon how people deal with it, to establish people in different degrees with Allah in the dunya and in the akhirah, depending upon how he deals with it. So everybody has been created to be tried. So it's now, and we're living in that time, we'll continue to. Any more questions, Ikhwani? For that I can't see. Go ahead. This brother is asking about uh, two ayahs of the Quran. One of them is the statement of Allah Ta'ala that fitna is worse than murder. Fitna is worse than murder. This is one of the ayahs of the Quran where the word fitna is being used and it has a different meaning that will come to your mind when you first hear it. So one of the meanings of fitna is kufr. So the meaning of the ayah, fitna is worse than murder, kufr is worse than murder. That's the meaning of that particular ayah. Fitna means kufr here. And a number of ayat of the Quran as the brother mentioned, Allah Ta'ala informed us Verily, your wives and your children, they are fitna to you, so beware of them. Your wives and your children, they are fitna to you, so beware of them. And another ayat is said, they are your enemies, so beware of them. This is the fitna that we were talking about. The Prophet mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fitna to raju fi malihi wa ahlihi wa waladihi wa jarihi. A man's fitna is that he has a fitna in his money. The job that he has, it just isn't taking care of what he needs. He's still in debt. He needs money. It's not enough. He's in a bad environment. He can't worship Allah. He's around now Muslims. He can't get a job fitting of the money. He's been forced to work with his father and take over the business, and he hates that job with a passion. He has to work a job where he's there all day, every day, seven days a week. Fitna. And in his wife, he has the wrong wife. Her and her family are a problem. So it's fitna. Fitting in his child. His child is running the street. His child is giving problems. His child is bringing bad attention to the house. 
bad energy to the house and a fitna in his neighbor. He has a non-Muslim neighbor or a Muslim neighbor. They have a dog. They're loud. They're not clean. They play music. All kind of issues. So your children are fitting it to you. That is the meaning of what we're talking about here today. Last question, Ikhwani. All the way in the back. Is it possible to have the fitna reduced? No doubt it's possible not only to be reduced but to be taken away. And that's why we ask Allah, we make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal to get rid of the fitna, to protect us from the fitna. And then why you have the fitna, you're asking Allah Azza wa Jal to help you in this situation. And the ultimate help would be, take it off of me. If it doesn't come off of me while I have to deal with it, then help me to have sabr doing the situation. So definitely it could be reduced and it could be taken away. Okay, Ikhwani, we're going to stop here. Barakallah fikum wa ahsan Allah ilaykum. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa